Uh, this is Paul Watson. I will not be interviewing him this morning. Uh, we're, how long have I known you? About a few years, yeah. Yeah, 30 years, okay. Uh, the reason Paul's here with us is one of our threads is activism. And in this crowd, you probably don't know this, but there are a lot of conferences that talk about things but don't do anything. And all these people here are pretty much doers. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, Roger will be here in a moment, but I just thought I'd introduce you and uh, kind of set the table. So of, of all of my friends, I know a lot of doers. I think you are the ultimate do, don't talk. And, uh, and you always have been, ever since uh, you started out with uh, Greenpeace. And I remember, t tell me if this is incorrect, but I, I think you, uh, were you thrown out of Greenpeace? You founded it. I was a co-founder of Greenpeace yeah. in 19, well, we started in 1969, and I left in 77. And they were a little uncomfortable with the idea that you'd actually might get thrown into jail for saving seal pups, as I recall? Or? I got uh, expelled because I pulled a seal club out of a sealer's hand and threw it in the water. That would do it. And they charged me with theft and destruction of property. <laughs> and I said, well, I saved the seal's life, and that's what I was there for. Yeah, right. <laughs> Very embarrassing to everybody involved, probably. It, it politically incorrect. Uh, well, I'd rather be uh, politically incorrect than ecologically incorrect. Yeah, right. Well, that there, therefore began a life of crime. And we'll, we'll learn a little bit more about that uh, going forward. Thanks. Thanks. Great. Yes. Part, part of old age is you end up with kidneys the size of lentils, I think. Um, <laughs> I wanted, one of the jobs I wanted to do here is I, uh, I've known, Paul and I have known each other for 33 years, and um, I just want to, Paul has such an extraordinary list of things behind him, you, you'll hear much about it, but I just wanted to say that uh, some of his writing is amazing. I often receive it, and here, here is Paul's reaction to an out-and-out -out storm which is coming down on his boat off Newfoundland. And he's there for the purposes of trying to uh, save the seals from being clubbed to death by this appalling industry which is getting seal fur from baby seals. He says, outside I can hear the wind intensifying. Two low pressure areas are on a collision course over the area where the seals are and the sealers have congregated. It could be a coincidence. It could be divine intervention. It could be karma. One thing is for sure that it is good news for us and the seals tomorrow for sure and possibly into Friday. Many of these sealers are crab fishermen, and crab fishery is more lucrative for them and is scheduled to begin soon. This means they have, lighted, they have limited time to kill seals, so every day lost is a good day for seals. Disruption rides these winds, and the howling gales are sweet music to our ears. The darkening skies, the freezing rain, the plummeting temperatures all conspire to support our quest to save the seals. The decks of the sealers are not awash with blood, but instead with freezing brine, and thus we have no complaints today out here on the heaving northwest Atlantic, for today, at least, we are a happy crew. I think that's a remarkable response to a storm at sea, having been through a bunch myself. Um, the thing about Paul also is his coolness under pressure is, I, is unequaled in my experience. Um, I think, you know, I would have I go, I've been out at sea many times in our own boat, but I've never been out with Paul on his, and the reason is, as I've explained to Paul, is that I have a back problem and I'm not able to go on his boat, and my back problem is I have a yellow streak that runs right down the middle of my back. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I would say that Paul is simply the bravest per person I have ever, I know, and, I, and then I would correct myself and say, no, he's the bravest person I've ever heard of. And uh, I've watched him, the, the, he often has people aboard his boat which are filming his operations, and I've watched that, and it's extremely impressive. So, Paul, my first question is, all these dreadful things you do, on what legal basis are you able to claim the right to do it? Well, the United Nations has uh, this thing called the World Charter for Nature, and it allows for uh, non-government organizations and individuals to intervene to uphold international conservation law, and that's what we do. Now, there's a perception that what we do is illegal. But in 33 years of operations, we've never uh, been convicted of uh, any felony crime at all. Uh, and we've never injured anybody. And uh, we've been arrested many times, but we win in the courts. I always look at the courts as just an extension of our campaigns on sea. But uh, I think we have a legal authority. But the, here's the problem. We have all of the, the rules and regulations, treaties and laws that we need 
to protect the world's oceans. They're all there, but we have a lack of economic and political motivation to enforce them. So out beyond 200 mile lim the limit, it's sort of like uh, the Wild West. It's a free-for-all. They do whatever they want. So what we do is we intervene against these criminal operations and we shut them down. And uh, we get away with it because we're in the same area beyond 200 miles and so they can't complain about us. Fascinating, good. I've also heard you criticize, as far as I'm concerned, it's totally unfair for relying on volunteers for your crew rather than on professionals. And I too have used a lot of volunteers in my expeditions. I know why I use them. Why do you use them? I can't buy the kind of passion that uh, the volunteers bring to our ships. Right, right and, um, But amazingly, in, in all those years, we've never had a single volunteer crew member injured. We have an unblemished sec uh, safety record. When I was in the Norwegian Merchant Marine for a year, we had three fatalities. So uh, it doesn't, you know, I think that volunteers, amateurs actually, tend to be a lot more cautious and, uh, than, than the professionals. Fascinating. And then what sort of convictions have you had over the years? The only thing I've ever been convicted of is in Canada, I was, I've been convicted of the, under the SEAL Protection Act. Because in Canada, it's illegal to witness, film, or photograph a SEAL being killed. Well, of course. I mean, that makes perfect sense, don't you think? <laughs> it's punishable by a hundred, uh, one year in prison and up to a $100,000 fine. And uh, so we constantly get uh, uh, arrested under that particular thing. And I did challenge it under the... Uh, uh, the Canadian uh, Charter of Rights and Freedoms, and uh, the judge said, yes, it is a violation of the Charter, but the government has a provision there where the government can violate the Charter. And I said, well, what's the point of having a Charter of Rights and Freedoms if the government can violate it? I think that's the whole point of the whole thing. But it's called the Notwithstanding Clause in Canada. The politicians in Canada are very smart when they set that up. Your, your freedoms are guaranteed unless we say so. <laughs> Amazing. Uh, I want to say there was one conviction that Paul was, had had that I was involved in. He got picked up by, uh, on the basis of a treaty which exists between the Netherlands and Norway. Paul had had some people, he hadn't done it himself, but some people that were working with him who had sunk some whaling ships up in Norway. And, and, uh, it was, and, they, and he was now arrested trying to cross the border and it was clear that he was going to end up in, if they took him back to Norway, I thought they would march him through the streets in some terrible thing would happen. So I, had, I knew Prince Bernhard at the time because he gives awards to people in conservation and I called him up and he called his daughter who is the Queen of Norway and she called the judge and said to the judge, uh, I really am interested in this program. I want to know what this happens to this man. The result was that Paul did his, his uh, conviction time, 120 days in jail in, uh, in the in well, no, the they, refu they actually refused to extradite me back to, uh, to, to oh, Norway. Oh, but then the Norwegians turned around and dropped all the charges. Yes. Oh, I see. <laughs> yes. Well, amazing. Absolutely amazing. But the point is, is that we, we have sunk 10 whaling ships. Yeah. We sank half of Iceland's whaling fleet in 1986. And I did go to Reykjavik and turn myself in for that. But uh, the Minister of Justice the next day stood up in Parliament and says, who does he think he is? He comes into our country and demands to be arrested. Get him out of here. <laughs> because they knew that to put me on trial would be to put Iceland on trial. What Iceland was doing was illegal. Yeah, that's wonderful. So how do you support all your operations? Uh, all of our support comes from uh, individual donors from uh, around the world, and we've slowly built up the organization. We don't do things like direct mail or solicitations or, or advertisement. It's all word of mouth, and uh, that's worked quite well because we have a very loyal following as a result. But it is an expensive operation. We're literally a navy. We're, we have three vessels uh, now, and uh, you know they're very expensive to operate. And we go to some of the most uh, remote and hostile areas of the world, like off the coast of Antarctica or off of Labrador and, and different places. So it's, um, it's, a, it's always been a struggle, but you know nothing ever comes easy if you're going to make a change in the world. Yes, how true, how true. So how does somebody support you who's interested in doing it? I'd love to let you have a free ad here in this, <laughs> in this thing. Well, we do have a website at uh, cshepherd.org, and uh, you know, we'll, we like to get, you know, we encourage people to sponsor, you know, our, our equipment and our vessels. So what, actually what people do when they invest uh, in Sea Shepherd is they actually see what their money is being spent in, in, in ships and equipment. And speaking of ships and equipment, you showed me some slides of your latest acquisitions. Do we have those available? I, I don't have any pictures of those, unfortunately. But, but when we return to Antarctica this next year, we've gone to Antarctica now five times. And we've successfully intervened against the Japanese whaling fleet, so we've cut their quota in half every year. We've negated their profits for the last four years. And so our objective is to sink the Japanese whaling fleet economically. And we're doing that. I think that uh, one more year we should be able to put them over the top. 
uh, but the, the campaigns have become aggressively more uh, have become more aggressive because uh, J the Japanese are getting more and more frustrated. So this year uh, they turned on us uh, with a, a, what they call low f uh, frequency. Um, weapon devices, sonic weapons, and hit us with water cannons and uh, nuts and bolts and threw golf balls at us for some strange reason. <laughs> but uh, anyway, they, uh, w what we decided to do is we go to see what the most powerful weapon ever invented, and that's uh, the camera. Yeah. And uh, we've now turned that into a television show, Whale Wars, and the second season begins on June 5th. And that's really putting a lot of pressure on the, on the illegal Japanese whaling industry. Yeah. We also actually go to, we also do have weapons to defend ourselves, but we have to engineer our weapons so they don't hurt anybody. We've never injured anybody. We have water cannons that fire uh, cream pie and chocolate syrup, and uh, we can slime our opposition with, uh, you know, 45-gallon shots of chocolate. And uh, we also will launch what we call non-toxic organic biodegradable forms of chemical warfare with uh, rotten butter and uh, methyl cellulose, which makes the ship's deck slip and stinks for weeks. So. <laughs> I told you he was harmless. I mean, <laughs> now that's fascinating, Paul. There's a wonderful Paul has done a wonderful book, uh, a couple of books, but the one that I'm that I'm talking about has an incident in it. I think it was the Faroese fisherman who came up on your boat, you, and you had just happened to have some pie filling that had, I think it had passed its sell-by date, hadn't it? Well, we get the barrels of pie filling from the U.S. Department of Agricultural Surplus Program, so we, I wouldn't <laughs> want to eat this stuff. It sits on our deck for like months and nothing grows on it. It doesn't go bad. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but the use that we found for it is that back in the Faroes, when they were killing whales there, we were disrupting their whaling operations. Uh, the Faroese uh, police attacked us with uh, machine guns. They started shooting at us. It had never been done before. And our only way of retaliating was to hit them with our cannons. And uh, so we slimed them with chocolate and cream pie. And uh, I was charged with attempted murder until it got into the Danish newspapers that we hit them with pie filling, and uh, <laughs> they, they, they dropped the charges. <laughs> I've, I've always just thought how wonderful it would have been to be standing on the docks when those policemen returned in their boats and their friends looked at them and said, my God, what happened to you? And they had to explain they had been hit with pie filling from this boat out at sea. <laughs> Paul, I'd love to get you to tell another couple of stories because we have some time, which is good, which is, um, and I'll get back to some other questions too, but Paul, single-handedly, it was just, I think, at the start of Glasnost, or maybe Perestroika, I can't remember exactly when it occurred, but Paul and one <laughs> other person that he works with frequently, uh, single-handedly invaded Russia. Tell about that story. What you, so, tell what happened when you, you were, he was doing it for the purposes of showing what, that the gray whale hunt, which was supposedly an aboriginal subsistence hunt for gray whales, was actually meat being used to feed fur farm animals right near the shore, and he thought if he could film it, he could prove it, and he did film it, and he did prove it. But what did you see as you came up the beach? Tell this story. Well, it was 1981. We landed on the uh, beach at Loreno in Siberia, and there were two Soviet soldiers walking, patrolling the beach because it was a fur farm. And sable, where they raised sable, is uh, it was a, a death penalty to smuggle sable out of uh, out of Russia. So therefore, they were very protective of it. So we landed on the beach, and uh, they just ignored us. They assumed we had to be Russians. I mean, who else would be landing on the beach? And our <laughs> ship was a mile offshore, but it had the British flag, which from a distance looks like the Russian flag because it's red. And so we, for 45 minutes, we filmed and photographed everything on that beach. And uh, as I was getting back into the, uh, the inflatable, uh, we had a UPI photographer and another crew member there, and a soldier came towards me, and he pointed at our boat, and he said, Sto eta? And I said, well, it's a zodiac. It's a, it's a zodiac. And he said, no, it's a mercury. It's a mercury. That's when I realized that they didn't have mercury outboard engines in Siberia. <laughs> Um, and uh, so I turned my back to him, and I pushed uh, the boat out, and I said, what's he doing? He says, well, he's taking his rifle down. I said, well, smile and laugh and wave at him. And so the two crew members smiled and waved, and uh, that confused him. And he uh, turned and started running into town, and meanwhile, we got back to the ship. And we were feeling pretty good about it, that we had gotten back. And then about an hour later, two Soviet helicopter gunships came out of nowhere and started strafing across our deck. And a large uh, Soviet frigate pulled up alongside us, and uh, suddenly the voice came over the radio. It says, Sea Shepherd, stop your engine, prepare to be boarded by the Soviet Union. And I said, we don't have room for the Soviet Union. We're not stopping. <laughs> and, and I'll tell you, that's, I'm sure, just what Paul said. <laughs> yes. Well, it's all on film. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but the, the thing is, is that the thing when you're dealing with navies is they don't understand no. They're used to intimidation.
Yeah. And no Soviet frigate captain was going to fire on us unless he had orders from Moscow because he may be making a mistake. He really didn't know what he was dealing with. And that got us enough time to get back into to U.S. waters on That's that. Fabulous. Amazing. Absolutely amazing. So tell me, tell us, um, how did you get started on whales? What got, made you so impassioned about whales? Well, actually, I started as an activist when I was 10 years old, rescuing beavers from uh, lake hole traps in eastern Canada. I was raised in a fishing village in eastern Canada, and uh, I would go around it in the winter and rescue the beavers and uh, destroy the traps. Uh, I was a member of a group called the Kindness Club then, and uh, Albert Schweitzer had set it up and, to be kind to animals, and I later became known as the hitman for the Kindness Club because of that. <laughs> but um, then I, I was the youngest founding member of Greenpeace when I was 18. Uh, but the thing, there was one experience that changed my life forever, and that was in June of 19. 1975 on a Greenpeace campaign we were confronting Soviet whalers off the coast of California. That was before the 200 mile limit. And uh, we'd come up with this idea to protect the whales by putting ourselves in small inflatable boats uh, between the whales and the harpoons. We were re reading a lot of Gandhi at the time and we thought that that would, uh, that would work. And uh, I, um, I found myself with Robert Hunter in this small boat and uh, in, in behind us was this 150 foot Soviet harpoon vessel bearing down on us in full speed in very rough waters. And in front of us were eight magnificent sperm whales that were fleeing for their life. And every time they tried to get a shot, I would block it. And then the captain came down the catwalk, obviously quite angry, and screamed into the ear of the, the harpooner, then looked at us, smiled, and brought his finger across his throat, and that's when I realized Gandhi wasn't going to work for us that day. <laughs> and a few moments later, there was this horrendous explosion, and the harpoon flew over our head and slammed into the backside of a, of a female in the pod in front of us. And she screamed. It was a very human-like scream. It really took us off guard, and she rolled on her side in a fountain of blood, and suddenly the largest whale in that pod slapped the water with his tail and disappeared, swam up underneath of us, and we thought he would come up underneath of us because we'd seen all those old Yankee woodcuts about them attacking the small boats, but instead he threw himself, hurled himself straight at the harpooner on the Soviet vessel to, to uh, protect his pod. He didn't have a chance, of course, but he, the harpooner pulled the trigger and at point blank range sent an unattached harpoon into his head and he screamed, fell back in the water in complete agony, thrashing about blood everywhere and as he rolled about on the surface I caught his eye and he looked at me and I saw him dive again. This time I saw a trail of bloody bubbles coming straight at us real fast mm -hmm. and he came up out of the water at an angle so that next move would be to fall forward and crush us. I could as, see his head rise above us and as, it, as his head rose I looked up into this eye, an eye the size of my fist and what I saw there changed my life forever because I saw understanding. He understood what we were trying to do. I could see his muscles move and he fell back and I saw his head fall back into the water. His eye disappeared beneath the surface and he died. Could have taken our life. He made the decision not to do so. And I saw something else into that, in that eye. It was pity. And not for himself, but for us, that we could commit such an act of blasphemy, that we, we could take life away so callously and without any thought. And for what? What were the Russians killing sperm whales for? Primarily for spermaceti oil, for uh, lubricating high heat resistant machinery. And one of the things that they were building was uh, intercontinental ballistic missiles using sperm whale oil. I said, here we are destroying this incredibly sentient, social, intelligent creature for the purpose of making a weapon meant for the mass extermination of human beings. We must be insane. And that's when I decided at that day, I don't work for people, I work for whales. And so, you know, after we sank uh, half of Iceland's whaling fleet, I had a critic come up and he said, just want to let you know that what you did in Iceland was despicable, criminal, reprehensible, and unforgivable. And I said, mm, so? And he said, uh, <laughs> I just think you should know what people in this movement think about you. And I said, I don't really care. I didn't sink them for you or anybody in the movement. I didn't sink them for any human being. I sank them for the whales. Find me one whale that disagreed with what I did that day, and I promise you we won't do it again. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Great. Good. Here. Good on um, then, the, the, and there's a new whale war series coming out, I think, this year. What can we expect in that? Well, about uh, two years ago, I went to all the networks and I said, look, you know, the biggest show on Discovery right now is Deadliest Catch. And you've got a bunch of guys going out into a remote stretch of water in rough weather catching crabs. I'll give you more remote water, rougher water, men and women from all over the world. Uh, saving whales. And we'll throw in icebergs and penguins and everything else. It's got to be more compelling than catching crabs. 
And as it's turned out, the first season has been their highest rated show on Animal Planet. And uh, we're going to, I'll be doing Larry King on uh, June 2nd to promote the second season of Whale Wars, which starts on June 5th. And it's much more dramatic this year because for the first time, the Japanese turned on us and we had three days of very aggressive confrontations, including three collisions. Wow. Wow. In fact, I do have a short clip we can show. Oh, you do? Well, let's see that if we could. Can we run the clip, please? Top story. An activist anti-whaling group has clashed the waters off the Antarctic coast with the Japanese whaling fleet. The group says it's driven the whalers out of Australian Antarctic waters and will continue to pursue and harass the Japanese fleet wherever it goes in a bit to save whales. Our mission here, and this is the fifth year we've been down here, is to uh, obstruct, intervene, interfere, harass, uh, and try and shut down illegal whaling by the Japanese whaling fleet and the Southern Ocean Whale Sanctuary. There's nothing wrong with being aggressive as long as you respect the sanctity of life. The whaling controversy is again in the headline. We've uh, told the Japanese captain that we're not tolerating their illegal whaling activities, which are prohibited by a federal court order from uh, the nation of Australia. What Japan's doing down there is completely illegal. They're killing endangered species in uh, an international sanctuary. As long as the Japanese whaling fleet is down here operating illegally, we will continue to come down here and oppose them. Should we stop it? Yeah. Let's stop it now. I love Paul yeah. Watson. I love. Okay. Um, we all love Paul Watson. We can go with that. <laughs> okay. um, one of the traditions here at Fire Conferences, Paul, is to have speakers comment on the future. And I'd love you to tell us what the future holds for you, because it's my understanding that you're about to take an entire Navy to the Antarctic, basically, this year. <laughs> We're trying to take three vessels down there, including a fast vessel that just actually set the world record for going around the world in 60 days. It was called the Earth Race, and now we're purchasing that vessel. And uh, it looks like a, I don't have the pictures, but it looks like a spaceship, really. And uh, it really does. It, it's, it'll be the vessel we'll use to block the, uh, the harpoons uh, th this year. But uh, we're also, you know, we're permanently stationed in the Galapagos, where we're working in partnership with the Ecuadorian Federal Police and the, uh, and the Galapagos Park Rangers. And over the last 10 years, we've shut down poaching operations. We've established surveillance barges. We have our own canine unit, which sniffs out shark fins at the ports and the airports. And uh, our next big campaign is to move in uh, with, into the Mediterranean to stop illegal fishing there. We've been meeting with the Minister of Fisheries in, uh, in France about uh, getting a coalition with the French government in order to, to make an impact there. That's the bluefin tuna that I was mentioning before, the most magnificent size of cattle and they're being overkilled at a horrible rate. In fact, there's no difference between a bluefin tuna, killing a bluefin tuna at sea and killing a lion on the plains of the Serengeti. Yeah. It's the exact same ecosystem. Really. Yeah, and not only that, the, it's like seeing a lion in, in, in uh, Cape, off Cape Cod and two weeks later encountering the same lion off Africa. They move incredibly fast. I don't want to use up all the time for Paul. I'm sure some of you would like a chance to speak with him. We have exactly five minutes left. Can we have the lights up and see if there are any questions out there? <coughs> Sorry. Do I see any hands? Can anybody help me to see hands? Yeah. Okay. Hugh Bradlow, um, just as a matter of interest, why don't you take economic activity against the Japanese? I'm sure if you put a video outside every Toyota dealership in the country, it would have may focus the Japanese government's minds. Uh, I didn't get the question, though. Why don't we do a what? Um, uh, take economic activity against Japanese, like boycotting Toyota. Boycotting. Well, I don't think that boycotts are really that effective. It's pretty hard to, it's your choice between a Sony, a Nikon or a, a you know, a, what other cam, they're all, everything's Japanese, you really can't boycott them. But uh, I think that what we are doing is an economic uh, attack on them. We're undermining the profits of the whaling industry. We're not into punishing every company in Japan for the excesses uh, of the Japanese whaling industry, which by the way is controlled by the Yakuza. And uh, so I'm not going to go after Sony because of a uh, Yakuza controlled industry, which is totally illegal. But uh, I think that we will be able to shut them down because uh, we've negated their profits for the last three years. They're now $60 million in debt in subsidies to the Japanese government. We're costing them between 50 and $70 million a year. So uh, that's, the, that's the language that they understand. That's the language that we're, we're, we're speaking to them. 
What, but let me just yeah, clarify this. What Paul's, the basis of Paul's claims, which I think are accurate that he has reduced the catch by this amount, is the fact that when he gets down there, they start fleeing, and they basically flee until they run him out of gas, or I mean fuel, and then what, he, but he's, what he's doing now is going to bring down a vessel with which he can refuel. So they can't hunt when this is going on, and that robs them of days and of catch, and so they have a quota that they can't fulfill. And that's what the claim is. Am I right? I yeah, and yeah. actually, uh, the, the Japanese are very honest about it. They came out and says, we didn't get our quota because of interfer interference by Sea Shepherd. You know? yeah. And so yeah. they said, you know, the, the, that's their complaint against us. So. Yeah. Yeah. Other questions? Yes. We need a microphone over here. Hi, I'm Uwe Feuersinger from Aris Capital, a family office in Germany or Switzerland. Um, my question would be economically, what is your annual budget that you need to, uh, to run your operations? Uh, our annual budget has, uh, is about uh, $3.2 million a year. Uh, it's very small, we're operating three ships on that, and uh, we're able to do that because we have such a large volunteer base. And uh, our biggest cost is fuel and uh, dry docking for our ships, and that's where about, in fact, 80% of our budget goes on those onto those ships. Great. Are there other questions? If there are not, I'll get Paul to tell you one more story. Yeah, Paul, tell us about you, in the film, you, the little clip you just saw. You noticed two people transferring from a zodiac to the deck of the of one of the Japanese vessels. They were very soon thereafter apprehended, and then tell us what happened from then on. Well, what we wanted to do is get this issue into the Japanese media. The Japanese media had virtually ignored whaling in the, uh, in the Southern Oceans. And so how we did that is that I put two crew members onto a Japanese whaling vessel in order to deliver a message uh, that the Australian federal court had just uh, issued a, a condemnation of their, of their activities. I knew they would be held hostage. But I also knew I could get them out because one of them was an Australian citizen. And there was no way that Australia was going to allow Japan to take one of their citizens out of the Australian Antarctic Territory back to Japan in chains. It wasn't going to happen. <laughs> and uh, so, in fact, at one point, the Japanese uh, sent me a, a ransom note saying, you can have your crew back if you do this, this, and this, like leave us alone. And I said, I'm sorry, but we don't negotiate with terrorists. And we'll leave it to, we'll leave it, we'll leave it to the Australian government to settle out. So they held them for about four days. But the great thing about it is, it, it, for the first time, it broke into the Japanese media. We're doing so many interviews with the Japanese media on board. And, uh, and now we've been able to keep that uh, interest because of that, because now it was a hostage-taking story. It was human an interest story, and, uh, and the whales got into the story as a result. That's wonderful. I, when I heard that Paul had said that he would not talk to, them, to, to people about hostage-taking because they were terrorists, the other end of the story is that the Australians had to pick these people up off the Japanese boat because Paul refused to take them back from the Japanese. The Australians brought them back to Paul, and Paul got them back on the boat. We're out of time. Let's thank Paul Watson. Thank, thank you. you.